Hello and welcome to this short psychology topic video, this one titled Mastering Research Methods, How to Teach Probability and Significance. In terms of other webinars, we have uh, another in our Mastering Research Method series coming up next week on the 3rd of October, uh, that one titled Teaching Maths for A-Level Psychology, Don't Worry. And as always, all of the recordings and resources to our webinars can be found directly on the Tutor to You website. Uh, if you follow the link to Explore, then Series, then CPD webinar recordings, you'll find all of the resources and all of the videos there just in case you've missed any. Uh, later on this week, uh, on the 30th of September, we'll be hosting our second of the Fast Track You're Planning uh, AQA A-Level Psychology events in London on the 30th. Uh, so if you've got availability and can come along to that event, it'll be a great day looking at active teaching and learning strategies, all for Year 2 Psychology. So in terms of today's session, two key aims uh, based on feedback we've had from teachers. Uh, first one, looking at what the difference is between probability and significance. It's a term that students often get confused with. Uh, and then more importantly, looking at some practical ways to teach probability in the classroom. Uh, and then we'll finish off with some hypothesis writing, which is something that a lot of uh, members of our community have been asking for some additional hints and tips on. So two activities lined up in terms of helping your students write a full mark hypothesis. Uh, so to start with the definitions uh, in terms of what is probability, and this is really a mathematical term, and probability is the likelihood that a particular event or outcome will occur. Okay? Now probability can be expressed in many different ways, and I think it's really key that you insist from day one that your students get used to expressing uh, probability as a decimal. And you can see I put a scale across the bottom of the, uh, the screen there, with zero being impossible, couldn't happen, uh, and one being uh, completely possible and definitely going to happen. And of course zero 0.5 being a 50-50 chance. So get them used to expressing probability in this way because they're going to need to do that within this topic. Um, one thing to watch out for, and I've seen many teachers do this, is that you can use many everyday examples to demonstrate the idea of probability playing cards being one of them. Um, but what you always want to relate that back to is getting them to express probability. Okay, uh, You don't want to spend too long using everyday examples without linking it back to either expressing probability uh, as a decimal or actually linking it back uh, to the specification, which is the real key. Now to give you some sort of common everyday examples which are quite nice and quite a good introduction to the topic, uh, you might give your students coins and ask them just to work out what the probability is that you'll throw a heads, what the probability is that you'll throw a towels and get them to express that as 0 0.5. Uh, that'd be a really easy starting point. Slightly tricky, you might give them a set of playing cards okay, um, and you might ask them what the probability is that they'll pick a red card. Uh, what the probability is that they'll pick a club, which would be 0 0.25. What the probability is that they'll pick a picture card, which would be 0 0.23. Uh, what the probability is that they might pick an ace, which would be 0 0.07. Uh, and then you can start to embed some math skills as well within these lessons, which should just make it a little bit more interesting and make sure you're covering some of the other key content. If you want to be really mean, and I've seen this done and it's quite fun, uh, you could provide your students with a bag of Skittles, M&Ms, doesn't matter what you provide them, uh, and you could ask them what the probability is that you might pick out a green sweet. Uh, I don't know what the probability is that you'll taste the rainbow, I'm not sure. But you get the idea. There's loads of ways that you can embed the math skills into these lessons just to get them used to expressing probability in this way. Okay. Uh, what you want to quickly do is get them to start working out probability in terms of something that's going to link to research methods. So a really easy way to do that might be to give them a scenario like this one. So you might say that, I don't know, Mr. Riley watches the news before going to work and Carol the weather lady says that there's a 0 0.05 probability of rain uh, every day for the next 100 days. Uh, you might then say, however, Mr. Riley likes to live his life on the edge uh, and doesn't use an umbrella. In the next 100 days, how many times is it likely that he's going to get uh, wet through rain? Okay, uh, The students might very quickly work out that there's a possibility of five days in 100, Okay, which of course could be expressed as 0 0.05. Um, and if we then turn that around, you might say, in other words, there's a 95% chance that Mr. Riley will not get wet, uh, hence the reason he doesn't take an umbrella. Okay, And you can see here, uh, just map that out on that uh, line across the bottom there. So 95% chance uh, that actually he'll remain dry, 5% chance he'll get caught in the rain. If we then want to turn that into what is significance, which is the next step, and this is where students often don't make that connection, the key is that significance is actually a statistical term in psychology which indicates that an association between two variables okay, is strong enough for us to accept our experimental hypothesis. Okay? And that intrinsically relates to the idea of probability. Okay? Um, and we can add that onto this diagram. So the idea here is that psychologists will only accept their experimental hypothesis if they're at least 95% sure that the results are caused by the IV and not caused by another factor. Okay? 
Now, what's important here, and this is again a bit that students often get confused with, is this means that there is generally a 5% chance, assuming we used a 0 0.05 level, that a psychologist might accept their experimental hypothesis when the results were actually due to chance and not the IV. So there's always essentially a 5% chance that actually we've said our results are significant when they weren't okay and that's a type 1 error uh, and we'll come back to that idea later on so you need to be aware that for psychologists to be happy we use this sort of confidence level essentially uh, of 95 percent and if uh, we're 95 percent confident that our results were caused by the IV then we accept our experimental hypothesis now that at this stage is still a rather abstract idea and what we want to do is give the students ideally an example that they can work through hopefully in class that will get them to really put this assumption to the test okay and I think one of the nicest ways that you can do that is getting them to run their own experiment in class where they calculate the data and then have to decide at the end are they going to accept their uh, experimental hypothesis or reject it okay now one way you could do that and this is inspired from the teacher's companion I've just added a lot more to it is to uh, use an activity that I've now called can you taste the difference and bring in some cookies for your students to try this out now there are two uh, handouts provided with this. There is one with a complete set of answers and a work through guide. Um, and there's also a blank version that you can then try in your classrooms uh, and, and run this as an experiment if you want and also get your students to calculate a man Whitney, which can be valuable. Um, I'll let you decide on whether you think that's a useful activity or not. Okay, now the first stage is that you want to state the hypothesis. Uh, and the idea here is we're going to say to students that we've come up with a hypothesis that the Taste the Difference cookies from Sainsbury's contain far more chocolate chips than the standard Sainsbury's bakery ones. I'm fairly certain I could be sued by saying this, but never mind. Um, so if I've written an experimental hypothesis for this, it might read that I believe that there'll be significantly more chocolate chips in the Taste the Difference cookies in comparison to the bakery cookies. We'd also want to encourage them to write a null hypothesis that there will be no significant difference between the number of chocolate chips in the Taste of Difference cookies versus the bakery cookies. And any difference between the two will be due to chance. So we've provided them with step one. Uh, and then you can get them to actually run this experiment in class. So the way you would do that is provide half of the class with the uh, Taste of Difference cookies, half of the class with the standard uh, chocolate chip cookies, uh, and ask them to count the number of chips in there and they plot the data on a table. So I've done it assuming that we, we look at 10 cookies from both different packs. So I've just made up some data for the purpose of this. So you get them to plot their data, doesn't matter what order they do it in to begin with. So that's step two, collecting the raw data. In terms of step three, at this point, what you then want them to do is to rank all of their scores. So I'm just going to go back. You'll see here that we've got scores for two different types of cookies. What you then want them to do is to write them all out in order so that they've got them from the lowest through to the highest, Okay, which I've done here then rank them in terms of 1 to 20. But what they have to do is any scores that are the same, they have to come up with an average score or a joint rank for those scores. So you'll see here that I've got two threes. As a result, both of those will get a rank of 2.5. I've got four fours, so all of those will get a rank of 5.5 because it's in the middle here. Uh, it's just an easier way for them to do this rather than trying to do it straight into the table. So I would always suggest students write out all of the numbers in order to help them with this process. Once they've ranked the data, what they then do is go back to their table and add in the rank values, okay? And you can literally then translate them from uh, the table that they've, they've worked out. So the number four you'll see here has a rank of 5.5. So all the fours will get 5.5 and you just plot it back into the table and it makes, makes sure that you don't commit any errors at this stage. Very simply, what you then next do is you add up all of your ranks for both, which then gives you a rank for A and a rank for B. So we get two different scores, okay? So that's step four done. Then it comes to the formula, which looks complicated, but actually is, is relatively straightforward. Now you, in terms of the man whitney U test, um, always works on taking the smallest of the two R values. So if I go back, you can clearly see that RA 66.5 is clearly lower than 143.5. So this is the, the score that we're going to use on this particular test. Here's the formula. And then it's just a matter of substituting the letters for the numbers, okay? And actually, if we do it step by step, you'll see most students will be able to quite logically work through that to get their U value. And I've just provided that on screen and on the handout for you. So our U value in this particular case ends up being 11.5. Make sure your students watch out for the brackets because that can cause you a problem if you, if you don't uh, use the brackets correctly. Once you've done that, step six is then to find the critical value. And the way we do that, of course, is using a critical values table. Um, on this particular table, they've called it M1 and N2. We called it NA, NB. It's the same thing. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so we had 10 participants, essentially, or 10 cookies in both groups. So we find our value, which then gives us a critical value, in this case, of 27. 
So nice and easy to work that out. And then the final job is to report the findings of the experiment. Okay. Um, so in this particular case, what we find is that our U value of 11.5 is lower than our critical value of 27. As a result of that, we can therefore reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the taste of difference cookies had significantly more chocolate chips at a 0.05 level and therefore we accept our experimental hypothesis. So there was a significant difference between our two groups. Uh, there are many websites out there, this one's a really great one, um, whereby you can check your number. So all you have to do is literally input the data for both groups and it will tell you what the U value is to make sure you've got it right. So U is 11.5. You can see here we've got U is 11.5, so it's worked out correct. That minus is incorrect, so ignore that. So yeah, 11.5, we got it absolutely correct. Our critical value was 27, which we said it is. So we know we can double check and make sure we've got it correct. And therefore students will st hopefully through this activity understand the kind of whole point of psychology in that because we're confident that there is a difference between the two groups, as a result of that, we reject our null hypothesis and we accept our experimental hypothesis because we know that there's at least a 95% chance that our results were caused by the IV in this case being a different cookie, okay? So as I mentioned, I provided you with a, a complete worked answer based on what we've just done there, uh, plus also a blank version. So if you want to run that in your classrooms, you can go ahead and just provide them with the, uh, the blank version of the handout and they can do that all by themselves. What you could then do, and I think this is a nice important sort of addition or, or certainly an extension activity if you want to introduce it at this early stage, is make them aware of the distinction between a type 1 and a type 2 error. Okay, So just for sort of recap purposes, a type 1 error is where we accept the experimental hypothesis when the results are actually due to chance. Type 2 is the opposite, is where we reject the high, uh, experimental hypothesis when the results are actually significant. Okay, uh, You could then give them a scenario to help them sort of bring this to life and say, well, let's imagine that those 10 taste the difference cookies uh, that we used in class were actually an odd batch and they had way too many chocolate chips and usually they don't have that many. The idea then being is that if we've accepted our experiment, experimental hypothesis, the idea that the taste the, uh, taste the difference cookies have more chocolate chips than the bakery version, it may be that there is no real difference and it was an odd batch. And if that is the case, we have then made a type 1 error because we've accepted our, our experimental hypothesis when actually they don't usually have more chips and it was just an odd batch. Okay, um, And you can then link that back to there's a, around a 5% chance that that would happen. Okay, So there we have it. Just some sort of practical ways that you can teach probability and significance and a nice activity that goes with that. Uh, by popular demand, we've also put together a little sort of session on hypothesis writing. Uh, and I'm just going to show you two really simple activities, but I found them time and time again effective to help your students write full mark hypotheses. Okay? Um, two very different style of tasks, and I'm sure everyone will agree that the real key to writing a, a decent hypothesis is to get your students to practice, practice, practice with these things. Uh, it just takes time and patience to make sure they're consistently getting it right. What I will often do is provide the students with a series of hypotheses, and I, I've wrote 10 that you can use there. Okay, um, And I always use a, the sim a similar formula each time. So their job is to always underline the independent variable, circle the dependent variable, and decide whether it's uh, directional or non-directional. So if we take one of those hypotheses as an example, so one of them said there will be a significant difference in the amount of sweat produced by participants who play sport in comparison to participants who do not play sport. If we then follow that rule that we uh, circle our dependent variable, which in this case was sweat produced, underline the IV, which was people who play sport versus those who don't, then get them to write that out because what they'll start to see is that the IV is always broken into two, at least two different, uh, different groups, okay? which in this case is participants who play sport versus those who don't. Our DV is sweat produced, but that isn't in itself operationalized. Uh, so you'd ask them to sort of consider, well, how do we measure that? And it might be, I don't know, milliliters of sweat, I'm not quite sure. But get them to come up with something where we can compare different amounts from different people. Okay, Must be operationalized. And what you then have is what I always refer to kind of in, in hypothesis terms as our three key ingredients. Because if we were writing a hypothesis and it contained everything in this yellow box here, then we know we have everything we need in order to write a three mark out of three mark hypothesis. Okay? The second activity is similar. However, it's the, the opposite in a sense. So what you do for the second activity is you provide them with a research question. For example, does weather affect mood? Uh, do we lose our memory as we get older? And this time, their job is to state what the IV would be for that particular question, state what the DV is, and then write a suitable one- and two-tailed hypothesis using those three key ingredients. So just to give you one example, if we take the do we lose our memory as we get older, uh, they might decide that the independent variable is age, but of course we need our two categories, so we're going to have young people versus old people. 
They might decide that the DV is memory and therefore, again, we need to operationalise it. So it just might be the number of words remembered from a list of 20. Um, and I try to keep them vague because I think it's good for students to be able to come up with things that we could use to measure the different dependent variables. The job of the students is then just to use everything they've written in terms of the IB and DB and turn it into a hypothesis. Uh, so you'll see here I've done one for you. So older participants, and I might even define that further and say those who are 65 plus will remember significantly less words from a list of 20 in comparison to younger participants, those who are 11 to 18. If we then think back, does it have all of the key ingredients? Well, yes, it does. It has both parts of our IV in there, young versus old. It has our operationalized DV in there, and therefore this would get you three out of three if it was a three-mark question. So as I said, I provided you a resource where you've got uh, 10 of those scenarios for activity one, five of those scenarios for activity two, and they're very, very easy to make up. So you get the idea, but as I say, the key, key with hypothesis writing is to practice it as much as possible. Uh, just as a reminder, so we're at the end of the session now, we've got our Strong Foundations workshop coming up for students, which is the last week of November, first week of December, and we've got nine dates across the country. So it'd be great if you could bring your students to that session. Uh, we're covering uh, really key content, things like research methods, inferential statistics, issues, debates and approaches and biopsychology. So we're, we're essentially tackling the, the most difficult material head on. As always, all of the resources are available uh, straight away in our Facebook groups, as well as uh, will be sent out tomorrow morning as part of our daily digest. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to drop us an email, send us a tweet or, or send us a message via Facebook and we'll do our best to respond as quickly as possible. Thanks again. Hope that was useful.